Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to Follow the Yellow Brick Road, Relearning Consent from our Four Queers webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded, Tuesday, January 10th, 2012. I will now let the conference over to Kat Maneski, Prevention Specialist. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, I would just like to start by saying that um, the Wixap Prevention Research Center is very excited to host this webinar today. Um, we are really excited about the content and hope that you find that it's very valuable to the work that you're doing. I want to let you know that, um, as was explained, you can ask questions through the chat feature. They will only come to myself and the presenters, so you cannot chat between each other. But we will respond if it's a technical question, or the presenters will hold the questions or answer them as they come up. So at the end of our webinar today, a survey will pop up if you can please answer that and give us some great evaluation feedback so we can make sure we're meeting your needs. You'll also receive an email later today, most likely, that will contain a training confirmation. If multiple people are on the call today, um, please send an email to kat at wcsap.org. That's my email, and I'll make sure that you all can receive your training credit, and you can print multiple copies for your records. Um, within about a week, all the materials will be on our website, so that will include the slides from today and all of the handouts that were sent ahead of time, so in case you did not receive them or were not able to open them, you will be able to access them on our website. Um, during our webinar, there may be one question or two that the presenters will want to ask you as the participants. You can use the raise your hand feature to indicate your answer to that question. And if you'd like to elaborate on anything further that you think is very relevant, please add in the chat features and the presenters will share it if they're able to. So please um, welcome Justina and Jessica to the webinar. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So this is Follow the Yellow Brick Road. The first thing that we want to talk about is our disclaimer. It's a pretty extensive disclaimer, but I think that it, it serves some time. Um, we are on slide three, so advance to the third slide. So our disclosure is because we're in the consent business, and we want to make sure that everybody in this workshop understands the information that they're going to be given. This workshop is about consent, and as we discuss different ways in which our communities have explored consent, please note, this workshop will include a lot of discussion about sex. There will be sexual words used. The resources we will offer may contain information that is sexual in nature. Some of the links we will share, and many of the links within those links may very likely not be work-safe and may contain adult content to be viewed only by people over the age of 18. Please feel free to step away from this workshop if that is not the information you are seeking. And you, of course, at any time are welcome to leave. <laughs> so we are advancing to the next slide, and this is who we are. I am Jessica Gilbertson, this is my voice, and I am with you today as an anti-violence uh, activist. I have been involved in the anti-domestic violence and sexual violence uh, prevention and intervention uh, movement, both professionally and as an activist for the past 10-ish 10, 10 years. Um, and so I'm really excited to be working with Justina Hazi lanier today, who is someone I've co-presented with a lot and is someone um, I admire also her anti-violence work within this movement. So this is Christina, and um, I'm a program coordinator for technical assistance at the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. I have also been an activist and advocate in this movement for 10 plus years. Um, I identify as a queer woman and um, would like to make sure that everybody knows that when I say we, I'm definitely referring to the queer community. All right, and so we are advancing to the next slide because we would like to find out who you are. So um, as we, as Kat mentioned, you have the ability to raise your hands on this so we can kind of see who's in the uh, World Wide Web room, if you were. 
So how many of you out there are advocates in the DV or SA movement? Raise your hand. Oh, a lot of a lot of you are. Most of you are. There's a lot of you that identify as advocates. And how about anyone specifically working on prevention? Any prevention or educators out there? Raise your hand. And those of you who are advocates, lower your hand. Or re-raise your hand if you identify as both. All right. Lots of preventionists out there. Great. What about folks who are specifically working in LGBTQ specific service providers? However you want to kind of include that. Okay, a few of, a few of you. What about military, law enforcement folk? Anybody on the line like that? Raise your hand. We do. Great. Welcome. How about anyone working specifically with youth or with teens? Couple of you, okay. How about anyone working in healthcare? Okay, a few folks there. Um, if, if anyone else wants to type in a couple of things in their chat boxes, we can see who else is in the room. Looks like we might have covered you guys. Uh, we, we're, okay, so we're seeing therapists, we're seeing uh, people doing counseling work, training coordinators. I assure you we will get to what the P is in uh, a term slide in the, in the future. Okay, um, some business folk, uh, lawyers, great, aspiring psychologists, massage therapists. Oh, that's really exciting. We see a lot of variety in this room, so I'm really glad you're all here. Thank you all. So we're going to advance to the next slide. Where are you on the LGBTQ spectrum? Now, I want to be really clear that we really work within what I call a continuum. We don't believe that there is, you know, people are really well, like, well-versed and people who aren't. We think that there are a lot of people in the middle. So what I say is, who here is, um, raise your hand. For those of you, those of you who are um, consider themselves experts, they know the queer community. They've been involved in the queer community forever. And then I'm going to ask, all the way on the other side of the spectrum, those of you who have very little knowledge about this and are ready to learn some more. So those of you who've seen a Willing Race episode, seen Queer Eye, you know the queer community is out there, but you're ready to kind of engage a little bit more. Okay, um, so there are always are various stages in between. So I'm going to say, who of you are activists or advocates kind of in the center? You feel comfortable talking about queer stuff. You might have some queer friends, um, but don't identify as queer or feel like you have a really vast knowledge. Okay, that's, the, that's what I would expect. Most of us feel somewhere between there and expert, right? I definitely have been involved in the queer community for a very long time and um, have been an activist and advocate in it. No, but I do not believe that I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination. So I want to just be clear that somewhere in the middle, we can all learn from each other. Does that make sense to everybody? Raise your hand. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Okay. We're going to advance to the next slide. Okay, so these are some terms. We just want to be clear that these are some terms that we might might be brought up that aren't usually on the LGBT, PTQ, or queer um, terms list, but they will be mentioned. If you have questions about them, we have actually sent you a terms um, got, kind of list beforehand, so please feel free to refer to that, or if you have big questions, ask us afterwards. Here I'm going to actually tell you guys about pansexual, which is the P in the, continue, in the um, list. So pansexual, I identify as pansexual, and, and pansexual is easily defined by um, the fact that we don't believe that there is two genders, that there's far more vast information and people in between, right? 
And so if I identify as pansexual, maybe I don't define my sexuality as um, I'm attracted to male or female. I went through the experience of um, being in a relationship where the person transitioned during our relationship. And I had to kind of figure out where my sexuality was somewhere in the between of that because I was attracted and loved my partner at the beginning of the relationship when she identified as she. And I was love, uh, loved and I was attracted to my partner. All of the stages in between his transition. So that's kind of a good way. I say that I define pansexual as um, somebody who is attracted to qualities in human beings and not gender. I identify as pansexual and I like a good pair of eyes. A funny disposition, a kind heart, and really all of the stuff underneath the genes we figure out later. So any of those other um, terms you can definitely see um, on that list, and please feel free to um, refer to them. Also, we're going to be using the word queer throughout this workshop to identify everybody on the LGBTQ continuum. And so while we know that not everybody who identifies as any of these uh, uh, letters or any parts of this community necessarily would identify with the word queer, that is the word we're going to use sort of for ease today. And so um, and, uh, as two queer women that are doing this presentation today, that's just a choice we've chosen. Um, but also we're welcome to any feedback you have about that and also, um, you know, any conversations you want to have kind of in the future around language. So certainly... We know that the language around identity is very loaded. So um, just uh, another kind of little disclosure on that. Um, and we are moving on to the next slide. And so this um, just is kind of uh, for all of you preventionists out there. We know that um, a lot of the times from, uh, we hear about this information from the, from the Prevention Institute, that these are the five social norms um, that research has identified that contribute to a culture of sexual violence. And so as we're looking at changing social norms to create a culture that does not promote sexual violence and, in fact, is working to end it, um, we definitely wanted to have these concepts in mind as we created this workshop and as we look um, into how we're going to change culture and, you know, ultimately change the world. So um, this is just sort of a reminder about uh, what the Prevention Institute says around the, the norms that contribute to a culture of sexual violence. And then once we know what those are, we can kind of look at where we'd rather be. So we're advancing to the next slide. So when we, once we shift from unhealthy sexual norms, we want to shift towards something, norms that build a culture of consent. So true consent is we actually call it true enthusiastic consent. And that's recognizing that sometimes when we have to say yes, because no isn't an option during sex. And so we want to talk about true enthusiastic consent as the concept of when we want to have sex and we are able to have sex and able to have um, autonomy and say that what we want during our sexual relationship. It is really important that we, um, that we understand that consent is not just saying yes in the bedroom. It's not just saying yes to even holding hands. Consent has a lot of variables there. And um, so we want to make sure that when we talk about consent, we're looking at openness, negotiation, and safe communication. And so I just want to, I'm looking at some of the chat questions. This is, uh, this is Jessica popping back in. And um, some folks are asking questions about the definitions list. Um, Justina referenced uh, a terms list, and that should have gone out, I believe, yesterday with, with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Somewhere in an email, you should have uh, a handout that does include the definitions of the previous uh, terms list. So um, if you don't have that, then uh, hopefully you can refer to your email and be able to pull that up. And so we are moving to the next slide. Also, as Kat said, it will be the terms list will be up on the website. All right. So today that we uh, as we were looking over creating this this workshop, we spent a lot of time doing some research, interviewing uh, folks from different parts of the of the queer and trans uh, communities. And so just a little piece of history that uh, we wanted to include as we are chatting about our topics today. 
is that I have been, as a as uh, an, an anti-violence activist, really excited about the sort of um, yes means yes movement or the sex positivity movement or really switching some of the ways in which we're looking at prevention um, in terms of what we do want and not just what we don't want. And uh, I'd love to see our movement going in this way. I'd love to, to see us taking power in this way and, and utilizing that. Um, what we want to talk about today is the way that uh, queer and trans communities have been doing that for longer than we as a sexual violence, uh, anti-sexual violence movement has. And so let's remember to not recreate the wheel, that this information has been done in a lot of ways and we can learn from it. And so uh, along the way, when we're learning and utilizing previous uh, work that's happened before, we want to remember to always credit those communities. What we also know, of course, in our movement is how often marginalized communities uh, often have their work co-opted and utilized and then not credited. And so we want to make sure that as we're looking toward uh, a new movement of sex positivity and incorporating that into uh, prevention work, that we're really crediting some of the work that's happened before um, and not having to redo it. And so what we know is that this has been, uh, there's been a lot of prevention work that we can look at and learn from within the queer and trans uh, movement. And um, one of those reasons is because within these uh, communities, we've had to learn to talk about sex. Because outside of queer and trans communities, uh, we are not really taught about how sex looks like to us. <laughs> and so uh, kind of in the world, we have um, often, as, as queer people, had to have conversations with other queer people about what sex and sexuality and identity is because it doesn't exist sort of in the, in the more mainstream community. So because we've been talking about sex with each other um, based on need and for safety reasons, there have a lot more conversations that have happened than have kind of in a, a, a straight community. Um, and so we also know that the ways in which that we as queer people have been labeled as deviant, I'm putting quotes around that with my fingers, you can't see it because we're on a webinar, but that this is often a label, of course, that many of us have faced, um, that somehow our identities or our sexualities or um, our genders have made us in some way other or bad or yucky or dirty. And so we also carry that through, through this culture. And so we know that oppression, homophobia, transphobia, um, cis sexism, heterosexism have led us to need to build safety within our own community because it isn't necessarily safe or, um, or, or we haven't necessarily been able to have these conversations outside of our own communities. And so also we can take this, uh, the fact that we've built these, these communities of, around safety and around the need to have conversations um, means that we have a lot of information that we can utilize from within our community into the anti-sexual violence movement. So we are shifting slides. So responding to violence. When, um, as Jeff was just talking about, all of these things that are happening towards and at the queer community, um, we want to recognize that queer community doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not like we go to the fire parade and we stay within our circles, right? So I want to be really clear that we've got to examine the benefits from existing power and power imbalances and, and working to create an even more even distribution of power. So we know that rape culture is something that we are, are actually really used to. It's something that we have a really hard time breaking out of because it's something we see on TV and in our lives every day. And that, of course, translate all, translates also to the queer community. We are not, yeah, we're not living in a vacuum, right? We're not all happily dancing under the rainbow. So um, recognize that this culture of violence and, and the culture of um, marginalized communities being affected by violence and by oppression as a Native American woman, I recognize that I am not just a queer woman. I'm also a Native American woman and experience oppression based on that identity as well. And so all of my conversations have been based around not just being a queer woman, but being a queer Native woman. And so I want to be really clear that when we're talking about the communities that we're going to start talking about in a minute, that all of these communities came out of the same culture, this culture of oppression and violence. And so 
and they experience all of their all of the oppression in the same in not in the same way. We all experience it differently. Um, and we recognize that oppression affects everyone. So even a white straight man still experiences some of the oppression that's forced and faced at um, at queer folk because I know I have teen sons, and my son, when he doesn't comply with social norms, is definitely called a fag, right? And so when that happens, I know that these oppressions that are happening to the queer community absolutely affect everyone on the outside of it, and it's definitely something that's used to keep people in line. Okay, so we're going to advance to the next slide in a second. I just want to be clear that Jess and I had a really fun time doing this workshop. One of the things that we did at the very beginning was um, we started having some conversations around the co-opting of our culture. And then we started saying, okay, so this is experienced in the queer community, but it's experienced differently by each of the communities within. And there's many of them. We're going to touch on three that we interviewed and that we've identified with um, in some way. So the first one, advancing to the next slide, is about gay men and St. sex. I have a lot of connection and love for the um, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Indulgence. Um, they just are amazing people and have been involved with them for a couple of years. I am not a sister, but I have a lot of friends who are sisters. And so I want to talk a little bit about their history and where they came from. So the um, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence were a group of men, including um, a couple of different races, including a Latina man and um and, and some white men that really experienced some shame and horrible things around um, the, the AIDS at the time, you know, the gay cancer, that were being put on the queer community. That piece of um, this is, you know, God's vengeance or all of those things that were passed out towards us. And there was a lot of shaming around, um, around sex. So it was really hard to get information about safe sex out to the gay men, you know, gay men groups. So one of the things that the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgences did was they donned um, nuns' habits and rode around in the Castro on bikes, and they handed out condoms and safe sex-positive information. And that information was, with, if you see the picture, um, in, a, in a little pamphlet called Playfair. They talked a lot about, um, about different sexually transmitted diseases. The interesting and fun part that I found was that they talked about shame and guilt as a sexually transmitted disease. I love this concept. I think that this was one of the earlier meanings of um, the earlier discussions about consent. And we know that it came out of this movement of how do we talk about being safe in our own bedroom and in our own lives when... Um, when people are, are shaming us and, and we don't have a lot of safety around discussing sex in the larger community. And so these samples went out with a lot of information and a lot of, um, and in, in a very fun way. Discussions were had in really fun ways. Um, and they still do this today. So one of the fun um, events that I went to with the Sisters of Special Indulgence that I love telling the story is that there was, um, there was an event where we, um, what well, are we, where I saw balloon strap-ons made. Balloon, um, balloon animals, as you will, but they weren't animals. They were, um, they were different, um, different balloons that talk, helped people talk about sex in a fun, interesting way. And consent was kind of built into that conversation. Consent was the most important part. And it absolutely made this, this idea of consent interesting and sexy and fun. And so I really want to make sure that we credit that when we go to talking about um, sex positivity within the um, sexual violence and prevention world. And so um, in taking what we learned from some of the some of the older sisters and some of the, the research we were able to do, and I actually got my hands on this document, Playfair. I really had to dig deep. Um, I couldn't find any sort of copies of it on the Internet. Um, and this is a piece of queer history, I think, that that um, is, is a bit lost. But uh, anyway, with some with some deep uh, digging on the on the Internet, I did get uh, my hands on this document, and if you can get, if you can look at it, it really is a fantastic piece of, of, of history around really radical, for, especially for the time, ideas around how to talk about sex. 
because, um, wh and what we can take from this now and what the sisters are still doing with this, um, with this uh, language is getting out there about talking about sex because what we know is that kind of mainstream sex education that many of us grew up in is that we were learned, what we were sort of taught either by omission or blatantly was that sex was bad, wrong, and dirty. Talking about sex was bad, wrong, and dirty. And so just don't do it, just don't have it, and then if you do, you're bad, wrong, and dirty. And so what the sisters have taught us um, and what we can learn from them in the anti-sexual violence movement is that you can't talk about uh, bad sex and the things we don't want without talking about what we do want. And it's also way more fun to talk about what we do want. And that when we are talking about sex and we are talking about putting it out there kind of really publicly, this is what sex can look like. This is what I'm into. What are you into? Um, can really lead to that kind of shame reduction of not being able to be open about what we're into and um, or the idea that I'm afraid that I'll try something that isn't, you know, somebody isn't interested in. We can minimize that by having conversations about what everybody's interested in. And this, of course, stems from the need to have these conversations that um, was sort of created as a sexual norm during the movement towards safer sex within the gay men's, uh, uh, gay men's communities. Um, and so I think that, you know, we, we did a really exciting interview with some of the Portland sisters. And, um, you know, we were just talking to them. What, what does it mean right now to be a sister out in the streets when you've got your, your, your face painted and you've got your habits on? And, and they're talking about being leaders in the community, about getting the word out, leading by example, that it's okay to be, and I'm going to use a lot of their language here, that it's okay to be a freak, that it's okay to get out there and say, this is what I like. And they talk a lot about whatever you are, whatever you're into, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, it's okay. And they're getting folks to wrap their head around that, not just within queer and trans communities, but out there with kind of the, the, the larger population. And they talk about how they don't have to be kind of as shy about it when they're made up in this way. And it also creates a lot of visibility. And so um, they're really, what they're working on is a message of complete acceptance, that we are sexual beings and that there's nothing wrong with that. And so these are all messages that we can incorporate and remember as we're doing anti-sexual violence work. I know that as an advocate, I spent way longer than I'd like to admit talking and training on, uh, you know, this is what sexual violence looks like without ever talking about this is what kind of sex we want to have uh, and, and being able to have frank and open and exciting conversations with people around that. And that was really missing from my work in this movement. And I really want to undo that and learn from, learn from the sisters about how to have conversations, not just within my community and within my peer group, but with other, other people within this movement, with the folks I'm working with who are survivors, about taking back sexuality and being able to to give voice to the things that that we want and, and are, are aiming for in our lives sexually. Um, that what, the sisters say things like, talking about sex more means we can talk about sex more. <laughs> and so they've really broken these ideas down into really um, kind of like dumb moments. Of course, of course, if we're talking about sex more, then we're talking about sex more, which means we're getting the word out. Um, and so I, I really love this quote that, that um, the sisters use, the promulgation of omniversal joy and the expiation of stigmatic guilt, which I said, uh, what does that mean, sister? And they said, love who you are and fuck anybody who doesn't like it. <laughs> I really kind of like that as a message, that, that this is about being who we are and about promoting that and being vocal about what we do want. And so I think that is definitely lessons we can learn from this community. Um, and that, that when we're having conversations about sex and sex with one another, that it leads to conversations around negotiation. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. Um, and the more that we can be shame-free about that, the more we can move toward that as a, as a larger culture. Um, and so I am shifting to the next slide. So the next community that we did some research with and uh, spoke to different uh, different portions of 
is the is queer women and BDSM. And um, so again, this, there are some terms that may be used here that you can reference in your slides. I also want to point out that in that email that it sounds like most of you got and those of you who didn't from CAT will receive afterwards. I've also included a really extensive uh, timeline of events within the queer and trans communities. Um, it is by no means completely comprehensive. I'm certain that um, that they're just pieces of, of course, I don't know. And so anything that, that you know that you would like and suggest be added to that uh, timeline, please let us know. But you can kind of follow along in history on that timeline with what we're talking about um, with these different uh, movements that we're referencing now. And so um, with, uh, with queer women and BDSM, there's a really interesting, I see a lot of, um, in, in today's kind of world around talking about consent, a lot of referencing of the phrase safe, sane, and consensual, which really comes out of the BDSM movement. And um, there's a lot of history about that, uh, about the coining of that phrase in the early 80s. Um, and that it's really, it's kind of a hip phrase. It's really smart, of course, to think about what is safe, what is sane, what is consensual, how does this look for me, that we know that this just kind of makes sense in terms of, of uh, you know, what we want um, and, and feel safe and consensual with in our sex lives. Um, but at, that, at the time, it was really, really risque. And it was particularly not just risque, but absolutely by a lot of people detested. Um, when it was when it was women who were choosing to engage in it, and so um, the Society of Janus is one of the uh, is the first kind of female uh, oriented um, BDSM group that 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 grew out of um, uh, the male BDSM and then mixed gender BDSM and then shifting to um, BDSM that was specifically happening for and with women. And so um, there's a whole interesting history about how um, the Society of Janus was formed and then shifted into Cardia and then shifted into Samoa and all of the different um, ways in which each step of this took, took a deeper look at what is safe, sane, and consensual. What is it that we're looking for and what do we need? Um, there were a lot of different um, work and conversations around power. Because, of course, as women, um, and, and then the more uh, this kind of flowed through history and flowed through the women's movement, the more that, that lesbians and then feminist lesbians, specifically um, as they were calling themselves in Samoa, um, were looking at what does power mean for BDSM. Of course, we know that power plays an enormous role. Um, but that it and that it is like like it says here on the slide an eroticized exchange of power negotiated between two or more sexual partners, and a lot of what people were saying is we know that there's power involved in the world. We know that in sex there's power, but when we're having conversations beforehand and contracts and chats around what we want to do with that power, there's a lot of control in what we get to do with power in terms of either giving it up or taking it consensually from someone else. And I think that's a really exciting way that, um, that this particular movement acknowledged the role power plays in sexuality and in the world and how that dynamic is, but actually says, so how can we kind of control that power and just make some decisions around what to do with it? Um, and so there were things like consent contracts, conversations um, that happened before the the, the play or the scene actually happened. Um, what we also know about what was happening with queer women um, within the BDSM movement is that they were very, very ostracized from the feminist movement, from other lesbians. They, they were considered, again, I'm making quotes with my hands, bad, wrong, and dirty. That um, this is a time that you will often see in history called like the feminist sex wars or the, um, the lesbian sex wars, where the women's building in um, San Francisco was not allowing um, folks like uh, um, Sam Watt to meet on their facilities where where um, now some of our really sex positive um, feminist bookstores or uh, sex toy shops and things like this were refusing to carry the uh, the coming to power book that Sam Watt produced that talked about how to have distribution of power that that uh, how to have BDSM style sexuality and how to have these conversations. 
And so, um, but in reality, uh, what these women were really working toward was that they believed that S&M can and should be consistent with the principles of feminism. As feminists, they opposed all forms of social hierarchy based on gender, but, and this I like, as radical perverts, we opposed all social hierarchies based on sexual preference. And so at the time when, um, when you know, when BDSM was really starting to kind of come a little bit above ground, there was a lot of effort to push down, and there was a lot of pushback by feminists and by lesbians within this movement. And still, their message and the lessons around consent that came out of this movement are things we can totally be utilizing today. So one of the exciting things that came out of the movement as well was the, um, the handkerchief code or the hanky code, um, which... It's a really cool way to talk about consent without having to say the words, say. So um, there's, we definitely included this in our um, in our handouts, and if we did not, we'll absolutely send you a more um, more uh, a clearer view of it. But I just wanted to say that um, the hanky code is where a a person can wear a hanky, a different colored hanky, in either their left or right pocket, recognizing that each, both the color and where you wear it indicates something about your um, your sexual preferences. So there are hankies that say I'm a top, and there are t sides that say I'm a top or I'm a bottom. There are hanky colors that say I like this thing. So um, it's, it's, that's really an exciting thing that came out, came out of the history of that because there was really some negotiation around if I wear this hanky, this is what I like. And um, the discussion around that is already, you know, being had. So some of the exciting things that we got to do during this, um, during this, getting to this, together this slide and this um, presentation, and I was very excited, was um, we got to interview one of the, um, the, kind of one of the leading, um, the leading uh, SM or BDSM women in our community. She is a dungeon master. She um, is amazing. Her name is Dark Lady, and I, you know, really, if you get a chance to look up some of the stuff that she's done, it's really interesting and fun. So we, um, when we did our interview with her, it was really interesting talking about the community of safety that's around, um, that's around the BDSM community and the, the inclusiveness that happens there. There are a lot of things that happen um, within the BDSM community that the consent and the conversations already been had, and so there's things like. At every dungeon master and every dungeon door, there is a list of guidelines that can happen within a play space that I, I've never walked into another event. Like, I've never walked into a bar looking to meet a girl and seen on the door, well, you can do this and you can't do this. And if you try this, you know, you'll be get kicked out. And know that there's people there to enforce those things. So I find it really interesting and fun that that's what happens in most safe BDSM spaces. Um, some of the other stuff that she talked about was that, that the inclusivity of that has become, even though it started really in the lesbian movement, that it's become a lot more encompassing um, gay men and a lot of folks are actually involved in this community now. Um, so there's also things like con consent contracts. And, you know, Jeff kind of touched on that. It's really interesting when you read one and you talk about that explicit consent. Because a, a consent contract has so much um, radical information in it. It talks really negotiated about what I want, what I don't want, in what space, what time, what way do I want it. And I would just love if we could transfer a lot of this to the mainstream community, this concept of, like, I am going to sit down with my partner, my sexual partner, whether it's for a day, it's for an hour, it's for a minute, or or it's for a lifetime. I'm going to sit down with my partner and have these conversations and have them in a real explicit way. I'm going to have them in, uh, this is what I want to do in the bedroom. I want to be tied up, but I want to, I want to have these safe words that will get me out of this situation if I need to. And so there's so much safety built into that and conversations built into that, into that that I think are beautiful and amazing. One of the other things we talked a little bit about was the um, – kind of the community around the BDSM movement and, and recognizing that coming up from the 70s, and that amazed me, by the way, when we started researching and realized that that's where it started, but coming up from the 70s, there's been this really cool um, community that knows that 
they are safest amongst each other, right? We are safest amongst each other. And so there is, um, they have created things out of this that are really cool. Like um, there's this event called Munches. And Munches are informal gatherings of people with an interest in BDSM. So they get to eat with each other. They get to socialize with each other. May or may not enter into any kind of sexual contracts or contact with each other. And I, I love this concept. I love that. People who are interested and would like to know more or interested and would like to be in contact with the community can absolutely look online or um, look, in their, look in their nearest um, gay and lesbian yellow pages and find munches that are listed. And so I just, I'm seeing a couple of things in the chat link and so I, or the chat message box, I want to mention that um, people are asking for a little bit of, of explanation for terms when they didn't get the uh, the email yesterday. So I just want to uh, let everyone know that when we're talking about BDSM, that acronym is derived from the terms bondage and discipline um, and dominance and submission or sometimes sadism and masochism. And how we're defining that is that BDSM is an eroticized exchange of power negotiated between two or more sexual partners, like it says on the slide. Um, and sometimes you'll hear the terms leather or kink used interchangeably with BDSM. And so some of the other things that are in um, the terms that Justina was just talking about is um, when you're talking about a bottom or a top, a bottom refers to the person who is willingly giving up control in a conceptual power exchange. Um, and then a top is re referring to the person who's given control in the consensual power exchange and kind of takes on the dominant role for the duration of the play. And uh, play is another term uh, that we've used, which is anytime people enter into a sexual encounter that does not follow traditional mainstream and or um, kind of uh, a word we're using also, vanilla roles, also sometimes referred to as a scene. Um, and vanilla is a word that is, is used for um, folks who are choosing not to engage in BDSM or um, who have sexual contact that is considered not kinky. There's no judgment in the phrase. It's just a word that's used within, within uh, communities to refer to um, different types of sex that people are interested in. So I hope that helps kind of clear up um, a, a little bit around terms. And so I just want to also point out that I know that the topic of BDSM is, is um, it's, it can be challenging for folks because there is, um, there is the potential and often is uh, sort of violence involved. Um, but I, what I really want to remind folks is if there's a piece of you that's kind of clinching up a little bit around this idea of BDSM as, as healthy sex or healthy sexuality, that to remember that this is a form um, based on its basic core principles, a type of sexual contact where people absolutely have discussed beforehand and who have um, created ways in which to make this um, interaction with the, per the person they're involved with or the people they're involved with safe and exciting for them. There's been the creation of safe words that have been taken from outside of this community and utilized in other sexual situations um, that mean various things to various people, anything from slow down to I don't want to do this anymore to absolutely stop right now. And so any type of sex or sexuality that really incorporates this idea that I get to stop any time, even if I've already started, um, is really something we can learn from for any type of sexual encounter, even if the sexual encounters don't include the kind of like level of dominance or submissiveness or violence. But also I'm really clear I really want to be clear that when people are choosing to engage in sexuality that does involve these pieces, that to go back to what we learned again from from the sisters, that there's no shame in it. Because if there is really uh you know, this is a part of, of whatever we're interested in with our sex and sexual contact with people, as long as we're not putting shame on it and as long as it's safe and as long as it's consensual, we don't have any, any real business judging it. And, in fact, there's so much we can learn from, from this movement. And so for those of you who, um, who are having some kind of, like, potential questions or, or concerns around, around BDSM, I really encourage you to look at the history. And there will be some links at the end um, 
of the uh, the PowerPoint that you um, either already received or that you will receive that has all sorts of really interesting historical information about this movement and the way in which um, kind of the, the radical perverts of the 70s um, were really, really marginalized and really oppressed within lesbian and feminist communities and the way in which uh, they were actually so very cutting edge in the anti-violence work they were doing, even though they weren't necessarily calling it that. Um, so just kind of wanting to throw that out there. Yeah, I find it exciting when we realize that some of the things that we use or say in the mainstream sexual violence movement started in um, in the queer movement. I think that it's exciting, but it's also sad because I did not know. And having been a queer woman working in this movement for 10 years, I didn't know that these people should be credited for the things that I use every day with sexual violence survivors. So things like safe, safe, consensual, and, and explicit and enthusiastic consent. These things came out of this, this movement, but we're being credited that way. And so I'm also seeing some, that, that there's some concern about misunderstandings of communication. Um, of contracts uh, that are lying to be crossed because of misunderstandings. And, you know, I, I think that absolutely misunderstandings are, you know, uh, in, uh, inevitable perhaps in the world. But I think that if you're actually creating a contract and having a pretty clear um, and, and uh, you know, safely negotiated conversation around all of the things you're, you're interested or not, um, that the contracts are really sort of like, if it's not on here, we don't do it. And so I really think that actually, you know, these, these munches or these contracts or the conversations prior to engaging in BDSM activity, um, and, and then things we can kind of learn to incorporate in, in the mainstream sexual, in anyone's mainstream sexuality, that it really reduces the risk of, of misinformation, of, uh, um, misunderstanding. If we're having this much conversation before we're even doing it, I definitely think that um, while there's always a possibility for it, it's actually reducing it. Well, we also want to be clear that things like um, Dungeon Masters and having the signs up came out of a space of knowing that there can be confusion. And so we don't want to say that that uh, the BDSM movement has all right and always has because, you know, there's people and people have make mistakes and people have confusion. But the thing is that these conversations have been had for us to clear up some of that confusion. And I think that that can be a really cool, beautiful thing that we can use. Um, and just, then just to clarify that dungeon <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean a dungeon. <laughs> it's just often uh, a word used um, to explain a place where, where BDSM-style gatherings or parties might happen. So. We're going to move to the next slide because we definitely also want to talk about, okay, there it is. We definitely also want to talk about um, the history of trans folks and um, looking at the safety that we can learn that has developed from this history. And so um, as I pull up my information here, I think that it's important um, to note uh, that in doing this research, I learned more than um, probably any of the other communities I, work, uh, I worked at looking into and researching because I think that we know uh, within our, even within marginalized communities that, that oftentimes trans folks are marginalized within marginalized communities. And so the history of, of um, trans folks is, is more challenging to find, um, both because I think it's not been written down and also because it hasn't been safe to speak it. And so I really want to say that um, that I encourage you to dig deep to find this because there's some really rich and engaging history within this community that we do that deserve that that deserves to be heard. And so um, when uh, on the top of the slide you see Star um, kind of as as the organization that we're focusing on, um, and so that refers to Street Transgender Action Revolutionaries. Um, which actually started out as street, street transvestite action revolutionaries in 1970. And just to recognize that that is not language that we would currently use, but that is the language that was being used um, with and within this community um, at, 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 in 1970 when it was developed. And so STAR was created by um, Sylvia Rivera, who um, many of you may know was one of the um, major leaders of the Stonewall Riots, as well as Marsha P. Johnson, um, just to point out that P stands for 
Pay It No Mind. So Marsha Pay It No Mind Johnson and Sylvia Rivera came together as um, trans women um, in the in the late 60s and early 70s um, as folks who were really um, active in uh, queer rights and 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 were really also being completely pushed out of bigger conversations around rights because these they um, and primarily because they were trans. They were folks who um, were sex workers. They were living on the streets a lot of their lives, and they were people of color. And so I really want to really highlight just how much marginalization um, was being experienced by uh, with and within this community, within the, the bigger kind of um, queer community uh, that, that still what, what Marsha and Sylvia recognized is that we really need to come together and build some safety for our people. And so um, one of the very first kind of uh, shelters for, I think probably the very first um, from what I can find, shelters for um, uh, trans youth uh, who were living on the streets, often engaging in sex work, were created by Sylvia and, um, and Marsha within the STAR uh, organization. And they were doing kind of, uh, you know, whatever they could to, to gather safety for the youth in this movement. And, and they were squatting in, in, um, in trailers and really working to develop a shelter system to be able to create additional safety for, for trans youth on the street. And, you know, I hear conversations all the time now around the importance of, of shelter for youth and the challenges for that. And then, you know, queer youth and trans youth. And, and so we look at 1970 and we see that these, you know, two very kind of shoved out of the activist movement folks who said, no, well, we're just going to do it on our own and we are going to help protect each other. And so I think that it's really exciting to recognize the history of what uh, Sylvia and Marsha were doing and um, that they were really saying, you know, we together have to co have to build safety within our our own communities because nobody is protecting us, nobody is is helping us with our safety. And so I think that um, you know that, that kind of is in recognition uh, of how we can look at building outreach strategies. Who we're missing? Who we're losing? and who we're not including the voices of. And so I, I think that um, this is a picture in the, in the, in the kind of small version here of, of Star uh, circa early 1970s. And I just, I just love how, um, you know, how radical <laughs> this group is here. So I think, you know, definitely dig into what the Star folks were doing. Look into what this history was and look into the way that, that we as an as a anti-violence movement have built safety and um, communication around what safety looks like within communities and the idea of shelter, really a lot of this comes from this community. And we have a lot of, um, of appreciations we need to be uh, giving as well as um, crediting. So um, how does this translate today into what's going on? So one of the things that we noticed when we were looking up this information and trying to find people to interview was that um, but there actually is a lot more information out today than there ever was, but it's still hard to find, right? Um, so I went to an amazing workshop with the Cascade AIDS Project, and um, it, it was really interesting to me that that was the first time that I really talked about that um, that kind of complicit, ex explicit um, communication around um that around gender and around what sexuality looks like. You know, there, there's this whole conversation that needs to be had around um, what what sex with a trans person looks like. And I think that that's what's created a lot of the safety around that conversation, around negotiation. And I think that, again, just like the BDSM community, I think that there's so much that we have co-opted from this movement and so much that needs to be credited. I am... Um, I would like to say that, like, communication is not just explicit, but it's ongoing every day. Um, and it, it's not just, you know, the one, one sexual act and we move forward. There's every time somebody has this kind of sex, I mean, every time somebody who identifies as queer is having sex, I consider it re revolutionary. And um, some of the places where you, these conversations are being had, a lot of them are online. And it's amazing that what the cre what online community has created how much safety is created for the queer community. 
and for trans folks specifically, there are um, a lot of zines and comics, there's blogs and workshops, conferences, and online and in person um, for this community. And I, I, I applaud it and also say that as we, as we move forward and look at how we want to engage in this community, we want to recognize how much they have contributed to the queer, queer community and how much they contributed to this conversation around sex. I think that um, as we were looking into kind of what's going on, um, like Dustina was saying, we found all sorts of things online. And what, what I see this kind of translating it is, you know, this is the way in which people can come together. In the way that Sylvia and, and Marsha were bringing youth together on the streets to create safety and have conversations around, if you are going to, you know, be engaging in, in sexual contact, here's, you know, here, here are some ways in which we can have conversations about that but that the Internet is a place where people are connecting on that now. And also the amount of um, conference, like like academic conferences that have um, really specific workshops around um, consent and sexuality um, within trans communities and how, how we're talking about sex and what, you know, what we like our bodies to be um, identified as and to, what we like to do with them. And, and that these are really, um, you know, I think this movement has grown enormous momentum in that way, in the ways in which the community is, has gathered sort of from various parts of the, the nation, various parts of the world to come together and say, we want to, you know, talk within our community and then expand that to within um, partners and people that are engaging in sexual contact with us. And so I just, um, there's lots of stuff online uh, around where this movement is going now and very, very clever things. You can see this, um, that they're also on the slide is a, um, a comic. And so there's all sorts of different mediums that people are utilizing online and then at, at, in conference spaces around how to have these conversations around sex and sexuality and gender and how we negotiate um, sexual contact within um, trans communities. And there is so much we can learn um, as a mainstream anti-violence movement from this community. So I really encourage you to, to look a little deeper into that as well. Because, of course, today we are we're really just, we're just uh, touching the tip of the iceberg and probably mixing my metaphors here. <laughs> so um, one of the things, one of the cool workshops that I have attended was um, around sexuality as a partner of a person who identifies as trans, as a partner of a person who identifies as two-spirited, and how I define myself based on their sexuality and how I um, create safety and negotiation around that for both me and my partner. I, I really think that it's important to recognize that, um, that I am responsible for my consent, but I'm also responsible for my partner and what they consent to. And this came out of like that trans conversation around, this is my body and what I want my body to feel like or look like is up to me. And therefore in this sexual interaction, that is important to recognize. Okay. We're moving we, to this. <laughs> we're moving to the next slide. <laughs> and so this here is Sassafras Lowry and, um, there's a, a really great anthology called Trans Love, and it's edited by Morty Diamond. I'm going to try a little um, technology right now where I'm going to share. Uh, I'm going to try to switch to this link so that we can hear, um, in Sassafras' own words, this, this, um, this piece that she wrote for the anthology that I think is uh, an example of, of what we were finding um, in our research and in conversations we were having with trans community members. Um, so I think this should work. So we're switching to a slide that we have so we can hopefully play this for you. We found so much really cool information in anthologies and in, in poets, like poets and singers. As we know, whenever you're talking about revolutionary actions, that poets and singers and um, people who can talk about it in that way can be really a beautiful way to move things forward because people hear and understand the emotion when you write it in such a way. So this is just a portion of one of the pieces that she does. So it looks like we might be having some technical difficulties for a quick second. Here we go. Okay. Never given a moment when my body struggled my own until I learned to act, to say, 
touch. Sound has given me back my body. He was working damage to flesh and not just healed it, but transformed it. When I have sex, it is not insert tab A, well, it's not formulate me simple because no aspect of my life ever has been. For me, sexuality is not divorced from gender. It could be. I can't fuck or be fucked without thinking of how my gender fits what I'm doing. I find nothing harder than transgressive body. Gender is broken. I can't ever have a all right, so that is Sassafras Lowry, um, and so encouraging you to look at um, the the Trans Love Anthology and um, see more of the stuff that folks are working on there. So we're moving to the next slide. It says community response to violating social norms. We're we're trying to pull that up right now. Um, so I'm just going to talk while Jeff tries to pull that up around when we are talking about changing social norms. We also have to talk about what that looks like when you're changing, um, when you when you have to, when somebody violates those social norms that you're working so hard to create. And we interviewed a lot of folks about consent and about the concept of um, of what happens when violating social norms happens within your community. Now, um, we interviewed people in all the three communities we talked about and a few more. And um, one of the things that we found out was that kind of that um, the communities had a very similar response to to this um, social norms violation. Um, they happened in different ways, but absolutely it was this idea that, well, that doesn't happen a lot in our community. But when it does, we see a rapid response, and we see it happen in almost every community that we've talked about. So, um, excuse me, in every community we talk about. The Sisters of Professional Indulgence talked a little bit about what, um, what was violating social norms looked like. And they, they can only recall one incident in the years, and we talked to some older sisters, in the years of their experience, the one thing that we could hear from them was this one incident where there was um, a man absolutely clearly pushing the boundary of, of um, consent with a couple of people on our dance floor, and the sisters surrounded him and escorted him out. I mean, it happened very quickly. The sisters knew that what they were looking for, and the minute it happened, they moved forward. Now, I don't want to say this happens every time, but I would absolutely say that, the, that each community has a way of responding that is really powerful. So we also saw, like, with what we talked about earlier with the BDSM community, that um, there are these clear guidelines walking into the play space. And those guidelines are watched over by people that trained to watch for um, for violations of those. Now, I would consider those sexual violence advocates myself, but they would definitely not call themselves that. They'd call themselves dungeon masters or dungeon floor or play floor um, you know, observers, and their job is to specifically watch, know the people's as they walk into the space, and to watch if there's a violation of it. And if that, again, rapidly moved out of the space quickly, and so quickly that some people don't even recognize that the violation has happened. So, and then moving on to the next slide, that what we're essentially working on doing here, uh, you know, we gave you a history lesson today, and so our intention here is how can we utilize this history and learn from this history um, in order to do the work that we want to do around ending sexual violence. So just remembering that as we're building true consent, one of the pieces we have to, these are some of the pieces that we can we can learn from and remember and kind of retain as we're looking at our own different campaigns around this. So remember about shame reduction that shame plays a huge part in um, deciding what we feel like we can and can't do sexually and can and can't say yes or no to. That there are all sorts of really exciting workshops and groups that are not necessarily explicitly about sexual violence, but that are totally about sex, sexuality, consent, conversations around negotiation. How can we connect with, with groups that are doing this already? Remember the munches that Dustina was talking about, where people come together and talk about um, BDSM and what they're into and what they're not, and how this kind of model is um, is really uh, safe and um, kind of uh, interesting model we can look at in terms of having casual conversations around consent. Um, 
look into the, the ideas of, se- of sex contracts. And um, and so that kind of shifts up, shift us a little bit into um, Antioch. And, and I know there are a lot of conversations around uh, consent and around what Antioch College was doing with their consent um, uh, protocol and, and before around um, their sexual violence policies. And there's a lot of mockery um, that happened and came out of Antioch's um, attempts. And, and if you don't know this history, please look it up. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time to go into it. But they were really looking for true enthusiastic consent um, and defining what that looks like within the college and within their sexual assault protocols. And um, Yes, there was a lot of mockery that came out of this, but I think that it was a huge step forward and definitely something we can build on um, as we look at contracts and, and conversations around sex and sexuality. So um, we're moving to the next slide and looking at, of course, so we've given you the history lesson. Now what? Where do we go? So I always, I always try to remember that the middle word of consensual is sensual, and that is something I've learned from some queer women that I think is important. When, where do we go from here? The, the important thing, if you remember nothing we said the entire workshop, I ask you to please remember these three things. Connect, collaborate, and credit. When we connect with queer communities, we understand that we're walking into it as maybe an outsider or maybe somebody who doesn't under, understand everything. And recognizing that as you're connecting with the community is important. Recognizing where your own ignorance is and trying to learn or change that ignorance when you walk into the, when you reach out to the queer community or the trans community is really important. Also recognizing that they might not call their sexual violence prevention work as you know, sexual violence prevention work. They might call it safe sex. They might call it a lot of other things. But recognizing that that's what they're doing, even if they don't have our, you know, industry language. Um, and, and definitely share the work. Share what you're doing and learn what they're doing to help. Um, you inform your work with everyone, not just the queer community. The second thing is to collaborate. Incorporate LGBT PCQ communities in, um, in sex positivity. Incorporate everything that you've learned about negotiation, either on their workshop or from other queer folks. Incorporate that in, collaborate with them about how to move that into your movement. And I think, as we said from the very beginning, to remember that as we're doing this, we really need to credit where we're learning this, that, that what we don't want to do is be another part of a mainstream movement that takes the ideas from, um, from marginalized communities and really makes the work ours, um, because we've seen this happen far too many times. And so we're, what Justina and I are really solid on is we're, as we're looking into history and as we're exploring how we can how this can help us within the mainstream anti-sexual violence movement, that we must be crediting the experts from outside of our movement, the anti-sexual violence movement. And look to um, create partnerships, of course, but also recognize the leaders that already exist. Um, and so uh, just the final sentence in the, in the credit um, part of this slide is just avoid doing this. Let's just avoid co-opting in general. <laughs> so just a reminder on that. Um, and we are shifting to the next slide, which um, this, in, in kind of sticking with the idea of crediting, um, that this is a, a small portion of what was, um, what we researched and people we talked to and information that we u- utilized to develop um, this workshop and our kind of ongoing work uh, with this idea of learning from our poor queers and ch- chats with our queer peers. And um, so please look at, at these names um, uh, with a little bit more time uh, on your own and, and see uh, the ways in which you can find out more. Absolutely. I am mean, really, if, you're, if you have some free time and you're looking at connecting with the queer community, Taking any of these names and plugging them into Google and just researching can give you so much knowledge. All right. So shifting to the next slide, these are the links I was talking about. These should be links um, that will be able to be, uh, that you can utilize within um, the PowerPoint that, that either went out or that Kat will make sure to get to you. But all of these are different articles and different um, things that we have found online that are kind of an expansion of, of what we've been talking about today. And so, um, and again, they might not be calling it consent work, or they might not be calling it anti-sexual violence work, but with this culturally specific, 
hint on that, you want to make sure that you're not trying to push your movement language on it. So just read it for what it is. It's, I, I think that you can find so much wealth of information. And so with about 50 plus, we have, oh, here's Star again, <laughs> and um, we have a little bit of time for questions. And I see already there is a question in the text box um, that uh, is um, uh, on the topic of sex positive in queer community, what is the response to NAMBLA? Which is definitely, uh, and NAMBLA is the North American Man Boy Love Association, I believe is the, is the acronym. And so I want to remember that as we're, you know, as we're having conversations, conversations, oh, oh, oh. there's the word, uh, conversations around sexuality, that we still remember power dynamics, that we still remember what, can, that, that there is, um, for explicit and true consent, no has to be an option. People have to really be in a space to understand what their options are around yes or no, and that when we're talking about age imbalances between young men and, and older older people, which is uh, usually older men and uh, the NAMBLA, that, that I, as a, as a sexual violence advocate, I, as someone who, who worked with exploited youth, um, want to recognize the ways in which you have autonomy and they have some rights to make decisions and that I don't want to put my my ideas onto what is right and wrong, but I also recognize the ways in which power imbalances are a very significant part of what's going on with, with sexual violence. And so, you know, kind of do what you will with that. Um, I don't like to label things um, unless somebody kind of is able to come to labeling it for themselves, but I do recognize that, that youth, often are not in a position to consent fully, enthusiastically, um, in a situation with someone who's substantially older than them. So, so one of the things that we got here was some questions, just kind of some tech questions around how to get to the Fast Press video. There is a link, again, in um, the slides, and Kat will provide those to you if you don't have them already. And we're also saying, how do you see porn fitting into um, violence prevention movement? And so also um, also a tricky and very multi-layered um, question. I think that there's really exciting feminist porn going on out there. Um, I think that Toby Hillmeyer is making some really exciting um, feminist porn that I would encourage those of you who have an interest in looking at some of how, um, you know, Porn fits into the idea of feminism or, or into the idea of consent or expanding the ways uh, in which we look at sex and sexuality in that format, I would, I would send you in that direction. But um, I think that, that much like in kind of the early uh, lesbian sex wars we were talking about within BDSM, that a blanket statement that porn is bad isn't going to work for us in terms of including everybody in our conversation. I think we need to look at the power dynamics involved. I think we need to um, have conversations around um, a culture, uh, a, a rape culture, a culture of violence, how that all plays in. But um, absolutely, I think that if people are um, feeling like porn is a part of their healthy and consensual um, sex life, then I got no business making any judgments on that because, again, that's a part of shame reduction. That's a part of of making sure that, that people are feeling like they get to do what they want with their sexuality as long as it doesn't harm anyone else, be that they're, you know, the people they're engaging with the porn, like watching the porn with, those people also have to be into and interested in, in uh, engaging with the porn. You want to make sure that your porn is also being created by, um, by people who are consenting to participate in it and that they're not being exploited in it. So, um, as nerdy as it sounds, I would research your porn. Absolutely. Um, you know, before engaging. So that, that's kind of my, my quick answer. Yeah, one of the um, references I'll also give is good dyke porn. Um, it's created by some dykes who decided they wanted to see our sex life on film in a way that actually um, applies to, to dykes and to women who identify as lesbians. As we know, a lot of um, lesbian porn is actually done by straight men with straight women and um, and films that way. So we want to make sure that we do that research as well, right? We would, we want if we want porn in our lives, or if we know that porn is in um, our partners' lives, recognizing that 
there's a lot of consent to look around that, and some of that is around um, really being accurate and um, and em empowered in that information. Do we, okay. do we have anyone else that um, has some questions, or um, is there anything I missed perhaps in the text box as as we were going along? Um, okay, so now what what does porn have to do with advocacy? Um, and so. Um, I'm not sure that it would play into my role as an advocate doing direct service with survivors, but I think that um, having knowledge uh, around uh, individual use of porn and people's choices either to use or not to use porn or being forced into participating um, when they don't want to, or people who may have shame around their interest survivors that we may be working with who are, you know, renegotiating what sex looks like after violence that, um, you know, we have to be able to talk about the spectrum of sex, sexuality, gender, without um, judgment and without shame in the survivors we're working with. And so um, just like anything with advocacy, we're going to, you know, be open to conversations that survivors want to have with us. And if that involves um, conversations around porn, we probably have to figure out how we're going to be able to negotiate that and talk about power imbalances and talk about, um, you know, how this works for you or doesn't work for you. And so I, I hope that just like a lot of things in the queer community, um, porn has been definitely deemed as dirty, bad, un not okay. And we want to make sure that when um, survivors are coming to us that they can share whatever they need to and be advocated for on that behalf. And so when we walk into a world where we don't enjoy porn and we think that porn is bad, dirty, or ugly, it makes it a lot harder to keep that advocacy perspective of, I might not enjoy it, but I want to definitely give you the rights you have to your own body, your own activism, your own empowerment. Um, and so I, I'm seeing a question uh, around what happened to the I in LGBTIQ, does P take its place? Absolutely not. Um, we actually, when we were um, looking at uh, building this this workshop and deciding kind of it, within the time frame we had which communities and what history were we going to highlight um, and just in recognition of all of the amazing work that the intersex movement has done um, it just it wasn't something that we had um, time for in this particular workshop and what I think often happens is um, the I is put in the acronym as kind of like and I um, and then there's not really a whole lot of relevant information or inclusion of intersex folks. And so sort of in acknowledgement of the fact that this workshop um, does not have information about the, the intersex movement or intersex communities simply because of time and space, not at all because of um, the lack of relevance. Um, it, it's just sort of the reason why we thought, you know, let's not put the I in because that is just kind of falsely sending a message that um, that that is one of the communities that are a part of this conversation today. So it was sort of a, a really specific um, decision on our part, but definitely, you know, I think that um, keep keep uh, uh, research and information and learning around the intersex community um, as well. And and in no way are we trying to discredit or, or take that out. Absolutely. And the other thing to recognize is that. Um, you know, knowing people in the intersex community, I know that some of them identify as queer and some of them don't. And so I want to make sure that we also give the autonomy there. Um, there are folks who are in the LGBTQI um, spectrum that don't identify with the queer label. And I, I, when we don't have time to delve into that, we wanted to make sure that we, we just left it off rather than going into the depth of information that's there. Um, and so I'm seeing how does all of this link back to the history of LGBTIQ folks and sexual violence? Um, in other words, how can we carry this history of sex positivity into our work as advocates in trying to understand people's differences? Um, uh, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, we kind of talked about that in the slide that talks about connect, uh, collaborate, and credit. That. This is where we can go with this, is recognize, you know, I hear a lot um, in the anti-violence movement, this, this language around silos, that we're all really isolated in the work we're doing. And what we really want to um, 
hope that we can do is, is interconnect and value the, the, the wisdom and leadership within each of those silos, but also connect with them, um, and not just around, like, when queer folks are doing stuff around sexual violence, let's get involved. But let's see the ways in which uh, queer and trans communities are having conversations around sex and sexuality and sex positivity, and how can we as anti-violence advocates or preventionists or therapists or lawyers or all of the roles we play look at what these conversations are in terms of how that fits into our work as advocates, as lawyers, as um, preventionists. Because the work is being done in different formats, it's just not necessarily being called the same stuff that we are calling it within this mainstream movement. So really, I mean, it's a big piece about not recreating the wheel, right? This work has been done, it's been done since the 70s. Why, do, why would we want to spend our time and energy recreating the wheel when we can credit the people who have already done the work and, and, and use it and enjoy it and enjoy the people involved? So I am getting um, a chat right now, I think, from Kat. Um, and so let's see. Um, oh, okay. So, so we're, we're the question um, quote talking more about sex means we can or talking about sex more means we can talk about sex more. And um, speaking of crediting, who can we credit this quote to? Great question. I like this very much. This um, we got from our interview with um, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence um, uh, members here in Portland. So um, I, I think that that can be credited to the Portland Sisters. Some of the founding sisters. And actually, if you go back to the, the people that we credited, it was those four. I think there's four of them there that we interviewed on this. And, um, and they're some of the founding members of the Portland chapter of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which is the second oldest chapter. And so that's that's like two slides behind um, in the list. I think it's the first the first group on on the the thank you to our four queers and our pure queers is the sisters from from Portland and their individual names. Um, let's see what is Kat saying here. Um, how okay? So there's a question around um, community response and um, how they work in the mo mo moment. Um, and wondering how um, we can change people from behaving abusively in the long term, kind of tying back to the slide around community response to violence. So, um, like we said from the, at the very beginning when we were talking about, we want to exchange these negative social norms with these positive ones. And the way that we do that is both being very clear about what our positive things that we're trying to work towards are, which we said like communication, negotiation, and, and ex explaining to people what explicit ex um, consent is and, and, and ex enthusiastic consent is. And when we do that, we start to push towards that social norm of this is what we want. But we also, in doing that, also have to talk about how do we keep safe away from the things that we don't want in, in our communities. And like I said, with the um, we've seen within the queer community a lot of different ways to respond to it, but it all kind of worked out to this kind of one concept of when somebody violates the norms, we, we pull them out of the group setting. We, we try to move them away from what we are looking for, that, that safe setting. And I know that there's def definitely different views, and, of course, there's things around how do we rehabilitate and how do we, um, how do we change that norm and how do, or how do we change the, the perpetrators um, so that it doesn't happen. I, I don't think that we interviewed him much on that, but I really want to talk about, like, when we are clear about our expectations as a community, um, it definitely makes the violations clearer. I also want to state that the thing within the queer community is there wasn't a lot of ways to keep ourselves safe other than us. It wasn't like calling the police was an option. And so we had to come up with some ways to, um, to change and keep people safe, to change the norms and keep people safe without actually calling the police without actually engaging some of those first responders that, say, the, the mainstream movement uses. And I want to be clear that that's still true today. I know that there has been a lot of um, movement forward in the safety for queers, but the truth is that there are still queer trans folks that are abused every single day and that sometimes those norms are pushed um, from with some of those um, negative social norms are pushed from without us. Like I said, we don't, we don't operate within a vacuum, right? So we know that there are folks who are um, 
creating violence and, and pushing violence on people within our community that don't belong there. But there are also people within our own community that have learned those, um, those violent behaviors as well. And so that, uh, that leads us maybe to this final question before we're done with time. Um, did you come across any community accountability processes in your research? And so I don't have any of that information on us. We don't have that on us today. But I know that kind of as a separate topic that um, I've done a lot of look into, looking into is community, community accountability procedures. And so I, um, I can send that out. I send that information to Kat. Just give me some time to kind of compile it because I think that is good information. And I, I just don't have it on me now. So we do um, kind of need to wrap up. And I want to um, proceed to the next slide because I think there's a, a great quote that um, so one of the names that we came about um, when we were looking at the early gay men's movement was Harry Hay. And um, Harry Hay was doing radical, amazing um, work in the 50s and 60s. And, and just to recognize that this queer work was being done so early is such a beautiful thing, right? We know it's been happening throughout centuries. So the quote that I love from Harry Hay and have on my desk is, out of the midst of our long oppression, we bring love for ourselves and each other and love for the gifts we bear. So heavy and so painful the fashioning of them, so long the road given to us to travel them, a separate people. We bring a gift to celebrate each other. It is a gift to be gay, feel the pride of it. And he said this in the 1950s. And then um, we sh are shifting to, this is our contact information. So if you have additional questions that come up, this is in the, the PowerPoint materials you have. Um, you are more than welcome to contact us at either of these email addresses, and we would love to keep conversating, conversating, conversationalating around this topic with you all. So please um, feel free to engage with us after today. And then I think we, we hand it over to uh, to Kat for our wrap-up. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica and Justina. That was absolutely wonderful. I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. And I just want to point um, everyone's attention to the wrap-up slide here. You'll see an evaluation that will pop up in a few moments when the webinar is is uh, wrapped up, and you'll also get an uh, email that has your attendance. You can print for training hours if you would need them. And um, as we had said before, all of the audio recording, the slides, and all of the handouts that were um, referenced today will be on our website, the WixApp website, under the training tab, under recorded webinars within a few days. And if you have any trouble finding any of that information, please feel free to email me, Kat, which is K-A-T, at WCSAP.org. Thanks, and have a great rest of your day. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.